Hi, everyone. This is David Cohen, and I'm here with my amazing co-host, Brad Feld. Hey, Brad. And this is the Give First podcast. And in the startup world, Give First means simply trying to help anyone, especially entrepreneurs, without any expectation of getting anything back. So we'll be talking to mentors and founders about what Give First looks like in action and how it makes great entrepreneurship possible. We polled everyone, and they said consistently that their favorite part of the show was the legal mumbo jumbo. So here it is. The following discussion is an expression of personal opinion and does not represent the opinion of Techstars or any company we discuss. Our conversations for informational purposes only, including any mention of securities or funds. This is not legal business investment or tax advice and is not intended for use by any investor. Certain of Techstars funds own or may own in the future securities and some of the companies discussed in this podcast. Got it? Today, really excited to be joined by Harry Stebbings, who uh, is a VC over at Stride VC, but I still suspect, Harry, more people may know you for the 20-minute VC that may change over time, the podcast that you do. Really glad to get the chance to chat with you today. And listen, the pleasure is all mine to be on the other side of the microphone is a, a very exciting and nerve-wracking day, but uh, thank you so much for having me. Really excited to have you and to chat a bit, not only about the podcast, but your life and career. And as you know, this is uh, all about Give First, which is the big mantra here at Techstars. And I know, uh, of all the people I know, you're one of the top people that have really lived that. So I wanted to, to start with a little bit about who you are. You know, what made you decide to start a podcast? Where'd you come from before that? Yeah, no, totally. It's a, it's a very good question. And it's so funny because I hear so many VCs on the show say, oh, it's so serendipitous, my entry into venture. And mine is the total opposite. Mine was kind of deliberate, strategic, and highly planned. Um, I mean, I watched The Social Network when I was 13, the movie about Facebook's growth story. And I think a huge amount in it inspired a, a generation of entrepreneurs. But for me, watching that movie, I actually, the most seminal moment was watching the scene with Peter Thiel investing in Facebook from Clarion Capital. It was the first exposure I'd ever had to venture. And instantly it just sparked this innate interest and curiosity. Was there a master plan around the podcast to somehow lead to venture capital or how did all that come together? When I was 18, I, I set up the 20 minute VC. I was at a, a college in London and, and so I had the time and I had the passion. And I was like, well, let's make this happen. And the most seminal moment I remember, I was standing at a junction on a road and I went to godaddy.com and I've been thinking about doing the show for three months and I bought the domain name, the 20 minute VC. And I, it was $10 and I had $50 in, in my whole bank account. Um, and then I bought a microphone, which was $20. So I'd spent, you know, 60% of my net worth on, on this podcast in the space of 10 minutes. And it made me do it. it. To be honest, the show wasn't really that big at all for quite a while. It's the hard thing with podcasting. And it's why many people give up. It's because it's just a game of who can do it the longest, to be quite frank. I just kept going because I absolutely loved it. And then I went to university. Um, we weren't making any money from the show at the time. I went to law school in London. I was a, a law scholar at King's, which sounds awfully prestigious. The terrible truth of the matter is I think I was probably the world's worst law student. And the shows then started to make money and started to really grow just as I was at law school. And so I left after a month to pursue the show full time. It's an interesting one. You know, I, I wanted to get into venture and my mother's got multiple cirrhosis, which is always very much at the center of my mind. You know, she means everything to me. And I wanted to, you know, join a firm of great people. And I knew most of the VCs in the ecosystem. And I joined Atomico. Um, and I really respect Matthias Lindman at Atomico, because I always think, you know, Vanish is all about shooting for the outliers, shooting for the contrarians. And the one space where actually... Do we do it? And like, can we honestly, intellectually and honestly tell ourselves that we do do it in terms of building our own venture teams? And Matthias took a, a risk on me, an 18 or 19 year old kid from London with no investing experience and gave me that first chance. And so I always remember that and I always think about him and how appreciative I am of that. You know, I've been a listener since pretty early on to the podcast and I, I feel like I witnessed a lot of that story, not knowing you super well, but... The, the hearing about the literal fork in the road, uh, that's a really interesting you know, moment for you. And it's funny that you visualize it that way because that's kind of what it was, right? I knew nothing about venture, like nothing when I started. I Sure, I read everything that I could and I have every copy of venture deals that literally has ever been created in terms of the additions. <laughs> But like, it's incredibly hard to know. And I just learned along the way with 2,500 shows. And, and that was how I learned. And I, you know, I'm so grateful to people like you for giving the time. But having that like firsthand, hearing the war stories, stars off the record, on the record, was just transformational for me. 
Well, the, the, this uh, industry has a lot wrong with it, venture capital. But one of the things it does right is it does tend to share, you know, information and know-how pretty well. Um, and you know, your show is a huge example of that. And we'd, we'd like to help with that a little, and hopefully our books and things like that do too. But when, when I heard you talk about the Facebook movie, I, I say that a lot. I think everything changed around that movie. Everybody started to say, "I can do it. I can either be a VC or I can be an entrepreneur." I think that was a moment believe it or not, that really incentivized, encouraged a lot of people to check out entrepreneurship. I thought maybe you were just a fan of venture and you kind of stumbled into it, but interesting to hear how deliberate uh, you were being about the show and how that might lead to something. Absolutely. I mean, if you read the, the Wired article, actually, when I joined Atomico, it says, you know, that the longer term plan is for Harry to, to have his own or kind of partner with someone for that, his own fund. And that was always from... The time that I started getting passionate about venture when I watched the social network, that was absolutely the, the goal and the ambition. Um, happened a little bit quicker than I, <laughs> I expected, but um, yeah, that was the plan all along. Techstars tried to, to work with you as well. We, we talked to you about maybe joining our team at some point uh, pretty early on, and you've also done a lot around the Techstars system and sort of, you know, I know, I know Brad and, and you have intersected a lot. So maybe someday, you're still young. You know, at the end of the day, the show would be nowhere without support from from people like you and Brad. What amazes me more, and I honestly, this is something if we, you know, if we're talking openly and vulnerably and honestly, I don't understand how you guys do it. You guys were always responsive, kind, giving of advice, and and everything that you've done for me. As I said to you before, this was recording. Like when I was like an eighteen year old kid with absolutely nothing, and it's just like it, incredible and blows my mind that with everything that you have going you have the ability to carve out the mental discipline and the rigor to really engage and give first. And, and that is a challenge that not many people are able to do. Uh, when I followed the pattern of your show and talked to people that know you, almost everyone said that that's who you are and they don't understand how you do that. I mean, wh why be so generous with your time, right? I mean, you know, you don't have to help everybody, but you, you end every email and every interaction with how can I help? You start them that way too. And how has that mindset paid off for you? I always find that there's so much to be gained, not in like a bad way, but just like in terms of intellect, in terms of learning, in terms of network, from that, how can I help? And it's never a hate. The worst thing is like transactional relationships. Like we're all just humans trying to get by and do well. And I hate the I give, so you give. I'd love to help. What can I do? And if something happens in the long term back, fantastic. And that's great. And I'm, I'm super grateful. But there's never any expectation. And I, I think that's always got to be the mentality going in. It's like, give first without need for recompense in any way. And that's always central to how I think. Huge. Yeah, non-transactional. And I, I was talking to Carmen Alfonso Rico. She was really pointing out uh, the whole podcast that you do is totally give first, right? And you're sharing these really intimate facts of life. And, you know, you mentioned your mom earlier, right? Sharing difficult things and, and doing it with a lot of, of humility and generosity. And, and her view is it's, it's just give first big time. Um, and so it's paid off for you, I think. But, you know, you had a little bit of a plan too. So that's okay, right? Yeah, I, I think, that, you know, something that I'm just more and more passionate about with time. It's just like vulnerability is a strength. I just find that there's so much like unwavering, confidence and public exuberance and actually behind it all we're all just human and we all have our flaws and everyone's fighting a battle that no one knows about it could be my mother's ms which absolutely upsets me immensely sometimes when she has a relapse it could be another issue with another person whatever that is it's just like everyone is human everyone has vulnerabilities and i just i'm so passionate that we're just more human as an ecosystem and less bravado if i'm honest yeah there is a lot of uh chest thumping and bravado in in our industry and it is refreshing and you know one other thing carmen said is your podcast helps people feel less alone right that that you know vc is so cool and you know you're talking to all these cool people but it's not games right it's there's a lot of real hard things behind the scenes and you know when you share that you help others that are going through that feel less alone I mean, that's uh, incredibly kind of hard to say. I think podcasting is the most incredible medium, though, in terms of, I, you know, you definitely don't really get it through writing some exceptional writers, but the tonality that is delivered through like podcasting as a medium, I just think allows for so much of 
more depth in relationship than a written article, a tweet, whatever the other medium may be, because you just feel the person. And I think I think it's literally, you know, they are in your head. You're not reading them. There's no disturbance. It's like the interconnectivity between the two parties is so strong. And I love that with the community today when you see people who will message me about my mother and hope that she gets better. Or I've been, you know, public before in terms of, I, you know, I suffered from bulimia when I was 15 and I tweeted about that. And I, I think it's important to tweet about that. I'm supremely passionate about bringing awareness and light to it. But having that connection and relationship with people where they feel they can message you and you have that depth of relationship is, is such a special thing about the podcasting platform. Carmen also told me to ask you about money, which is a strange transition, but we'll make it. She wanted to know, is it, is it a driver or should it be a driver? What actually motivates you? Does money play into it? And how so? Because, you know, VC, we talk so much about money, but I've sometimes found that the best VCs are less motivated by that and more motivated by just helping. Totally. I, I've spoken to, you know, some of the most successful VCs on the planet who never need to work again, but it's, it's not the case of money. It's the case of working with founders, building companies, building firms as well. VC firms and startups. In terms of money, it was a real realization early on. And I think money is kind of uh, fragmented into kind of two different views. So if we take the like, first view, which is mine, which is like, I thought money was central to my thinking for, for quite a few years, maybe from 13 to 19 or 20. And then I had a little bit of money, n- n- by no means a lot, but a little bit where I could afford more things in life. And then I, I sat back and I was like, what truly makes Harry happy? And what truly makes Harry happy is going spinning on a Sunday morning and going for brunch with my mother and my brother and and having a great time with them. And I thought, huh, that, that doesn't require that much money. It requires a little bit of money and a base layer of money, but it doesn't require a huge amount. So this kind of maniacal focus on money as the central point maybe is wrong. And that's, that's, that's not it at all. I, I, you know, I question knowing myself then and my own relationship to money. And I think I'm a lot more comfortable with that now. And actually, I love what I do. I'm supremely passionate about it. Money is fan- fantastic in many ways, but it's the outcome of the work that I do. And to have a little bit of almost distance between yourself and knowing exactly why, why you want that. The other side of the money kind of equation and thought is that actually, you know, I think we chastise and criticize so many people for being incredibly money centric today. And I've, I've had founders that say, I want to build a billion dollar business because I want to make X amount of money. And that is the goal. And that's what drives me. And you, you, you kind of ask yourself, you know, is that right? Is that wrong? But actually, I think it's okay. And I don't think it's right to criticize them for having that as the driver. They have something that fundamentally drives them. For me as an investor, you know, interested in them building the biggest company that they can build, having a maniacal focus on that as an outcome doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing at all. As long as they have that driver that makes them, you know, work and commit themselves to that project for the distance that it will take to run through, I don't mind that. And so I think kind of changing the attitude that we have in venture to how people think about money also sometimes wouldn't be a bad thing. It's interesting you say that because I've I've always thought about, you know, needing some intrinsic motivation. And I guess money can be one of those. Um, But I think I've heard a lot of conventional wisdom to your point that it can't be just that. But maybe it can if they're really driven by that. I, I like the entrepreneurs that also have something else if they do have that that's really driving them. Do you know why we started monetizing the 20-minute VC? It's because my mother came home one day with a healthcare bill for her MS, and it was about £150,000, so it's a $200,000. We couldn't afford it. That's a huge amount of money. And I had this asset, which was the show, and we had a decent size audience, and I thought, I- I've got to do something. I-, I-, I have to help, and we have to make this work. So the next day, I set about monetizing the show. Actually, that night, I remember sending out like prospectuses to advertisers. And, you know, within a week, the show was actually fully monetizing her with kind of contracted revenue through the sponsors. But that was absolutely the core driver. So, I mean, another interesting question is like, why is the money the driver? Because the money was driving me then, but it was for a different reason. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. And I would say the driver there was your mom right? Um, that's what you actually cared about. And the money was to support that, that thing that you cared about. But if it was just purely to, you know, add zeros to your bank account, I mean, I know one reason is the mojitos are getting more expensive. Um, <laughs> for sure. I mean, but it, it, again, it, to your point, there, there are levels, you know, you, personally, you get to a point where you have enough money to be comfortable. And then you get to a level where, you know, you can 
fly first class or take a nice vacation. But you know, that, that is sort of the utility of money. It changes in step functions, not, you know, sort of linearly every day as you get more and more. And I think a lot of people lose sight of that when they think about money. But if we're, if we're thinking like vulnerably and openly and just having an honest conversation, which is what I'm trying to do more and more with everyone is just like, you know, what's my biggest weakness right now is that so far in my life, really, like what makes me truly fundamentally happy has been, you know, work and everything that comes with work, which is absolutely what makes me happy now. But maybe there, there's something more that I need, be it a sport, be it art, be it theater, be it whatever that extra hobby is. And so it's kind of a little bit of self-discovery on what makes me happy outside, which I think actually then also comes back into making you a better investor, expanding expanding your mindset, changes how you think of the world, whatever it may be. But that's a big challenge for me now. Like, How do I discover more of myself and what I like to do? Harry, you're an old soul. I, I didn't learn these things, uh, if I've even learned them at all, until I was in my 40s or 50s. Um, I'm early 50s, by the way. Don't get too excited. Um, you're learning them when you're so young. And I think that's going to pay off in huge ways and make you a wiser investor and really wiser in everything that you do. So when I talked to your partner, Fred, um, he, he was really back to this idea of, of just, you know, you're so giving, but you also just, he feels like you have this incredible energy to be generous with your time. And you remember the names of everybody's kids and the football team that they support. How do you do that? How can others do what you do, which is to be so good at that network and to be so good at genuinely wanting to give? Because we all talk about give first, but it takes real time and real energy. Do you have any secret tools or systems that you use, or do you really just have that kind of photographic memory and passion for all of it? I mean, honestly, the truth is that if you ask me what I like love most, is it's people. I am people centric, and so whenever I hear about you know someone's dog or they support Manchester United or that their family goes on holiday to Barcelona every year, I remember that because people is the driver of everything. You know, firms are made up of people, companies are made up of people, and where I derive really all joy is is from people and from engagement and communication. I, I don't derive any joy from any form of Google Sheet or Excel where maybe other people <laughs> do absolutely. But like for me, that is it's where I like to spend most of my time and I'm just most passionate. So I I don't think there's like a hack. I think you just have to be fundamentally hugely passionate about engagement, connection, and true connection. Like, you know, we spend so much time talking about things that are actually largely not irrelevant, but surface level and there's so much to so many people that we don't discuss and discover and it's an interesting one i was chatting to an ambassador the other day and he said to harry why do you ask like a founder on a monday morning when you meet them talk to me about your weekend what did you get up to and he said why do you ask that let's get straight into the business let's talk about pricing let's talk about competition let's just let's get the show on the road and i said that's interesting so i just had a founder who came to me and said that he had spent 14 hours reworking the code base. There was this problem, this problem. He had to bring in this person to help him. And then it ended up going through to Sunday. And this is how he thought about it, having slept on it on Saturday night and how his mindset had changed. And I said to the ambassador, I wouldn't have known any of that if I just dove straight into the business. That was probably the most important five minutes of the whole meeting, hearing you know the evolution of his mindset, how much grit and work ethic this guy has. And so kind of, you know, things like that, I just find super interesting. And it's where all of the value is derived, I think. Fundamentally, business is all about the people, right? And so I think really having genuine connections with people is something that feels like comes quite easy to you. For me, it's been a real struggle. It's something that hasn't been natural for me. But in this business, yeah, you have to really understand the people, what's motivating them, what they care about. And I think in general, in the world, that's important. So if you ask yourself, like, actually, how can I do that? I think there are a couple of things that you can do. Like, one, take them out of the traditional office environment. I think everyone clowns up more, is less giving, is less vulnerable, is less humble in, in a you know, stale office environment, however lovely an office may be. Go to a coffee shop, go to a restaurant, go to whatever it is. Walk around the park. I love going for a walk around the park and do that. And, and it's just asking questions like, tell me, David. Like, what's your relationship to money? And when you ask a question that's actually very strange, like, what's your relationship to money? It will definitely set people aback. And the way to mitigate kind of them not opening up to you is you then say how you think about it. And it's really interesting, actually, to dialogue your thoughts by asking those questions. And then you see how you and yourself change over time. But then because you give, like, I will often say, 
how do you think about your relationship to money? And I'll say mine first. And then they'll go, oh, that's really interesting, actually. Okay, yeah, this is how I think. And because my walls have been brought down and I've opened up to them about how I've changed my thinking on money, they then do theirs. And so I think you do, when you ask these vulnerable questions, have to give real, honest answers and vulnerable answers in many cases that will then allow them to feel they can open up. Totally agree. But one of the questions I was talking to John Henderson at Airtree, he said to ask you, this ties right in, how do you manage that when it's ever increasing, right? You're building this enormous network. I have the same problem. You know tennis. I know mojitos about you, right? You have your tidbits that you can connect to on a personal level. But how do you do that when that network becomes 500, 1,000, 5,000 people? (laughs) <laughs> it's so funny you said about John Henderson. John Henderson was the one that taught me that like depth of relationship is built through like expanding the platforms that you engage on and really building kind of personal connections through them. So uh, John has also probably single handedly been the mentor that's been there for me more than any other. This was a, a, a guy that met me 10 shows in. I had absolutely nothing. And he's been there for me through absolutely everything. Every up, every down, whenever I have a real problem now, I will call him. He's always there. And um, yeah, he's a very special guy that also never likes any praise. And so he'll feel incredibly uncomfortable with this, which uh, is funny. But in terms of the expanded network and how you deal with it, you've got to commit to it. If you're going to pursue the strategy, then, and it's, it's not a nice way to say strategy, but if you're going to pursue this as like the way that you want to work, which is how I want to work, people-centric, human-centric, and personality-based, then that is part of your workflow and you spend less time on email, you spend less time doing other things and you have to commit yourself to it. Is it easy? No, it's insanely hard. I spend 45 minutes every night DMing every new single follower on Twitter, thanking them for following me. I'll mention something about the city that they're in, whether it's I've been to it, I'd love to go to it, I'd love to run through it. I hear they've got great mojitos, monuments, whatever that may be, build a relationship with them. The community is incredible. I spend 45 minutes every night DMing new followers personally, which is incredible as well because you meet some phenomenal people doing awesome things. But it takes time and it's 1.30 to 2.15 on my balcony every every evening. And you, you just commit to it. I mean, it's a really bad answer, but it's something that I'm wholeheartedly committed to. And the fruits of it just continue to pay off in every single way. You know, you DM someone and then it transpires to actually, you know, it happened the other day, DM someone, I was doing diligence on a particular company and DM'd him and then we started a chat and it turned out that he was a particular thought leader in this given space. And we instantly started kind of scheduling the diligence call and he was so happy to help me and he was definitely the single most valuable part of the diligence process for me on this one opportunity and it came through a twitter dm completely out of the blue that that i did because he followed me that day changed the way i think about a market and a company but that's the whole beauty of give first right It, it escalates it's a virtuous cycle right like just thanking someone then building a little relationship, then there's some moment where one of you can help the other and you're not thinking about it transactionally, but it's not give to get, it's giving into the system and then you'll be able to get back from that system in totally unexpected ways. Totally. But like, it it is supremely hard. And I don't think it's like people should have it as like, oh, I need to do that. It's one chosen path, but there's other chosen paths, be it, you know, deeply analytical and insightful on x area or you know y process or whatever that may be it's just my chosen path and i just think the biggest thing is like at your core it is so hard to scale and scale authentically that it just has to be you otherwise like a company it's just too hard and you'll just at 115 being knackered after a long hard day you won't be doing it i got one more question that i i need to know it's really just for me and i hope people listening actually want to hear it too, because I really do. When you think back, you've done so many shows. How how many now have you done on 20 Minute VC? 2,850. (laughs) Crazy number. You've talked to so many amazing people, and I know it's hard to pick one or maybe two, but any things that stand out that you feel like really helped a lot of people, whether it helped you or not, that you heard on your show that maybe we could amplify here? That's a really tough question. I mean, there are definitely episodes for me that stand out. Um, Josh Kaufman on the show 
was absolutely incredible. When you think about how he talks about partnership dynamics, um, the potential problems and challenges that come from attribution, what that means for board members who come into a boardroom and feel completely liberated to be themselves, to engage with founders in a completely different way than when they have the, the might of a partnership going, it's your deal, make it work. To Bill Gurley talking about you know market risk and how he thinks about that and how it's changed over time. You know, to my partner, uh, Fred Destat, who talks about kind of organized chaos and how startups have been able to so incredibly scale efficiency over income when you look at someone like Pillpack with a 45 person engineering team that essentially almost out engineered Amazon, who spent a reported, I have no idea, but a reported half billion dollars on building out a pharmacy OS. And they did it with 45 engineers at Pillpack in three years compared to Amazon 7. And, and hearing that, in terms of kind of the biggest takeaways, it's such a hard question. Yeah, there's, there's, there's another one actually, Henry Ward, Carter. Um, which is a phenomenal and fascinating company. And it's actually kind of really um, seminal to his thoughts here, which is talking about N1 versus 1N markets. And it's essentially um, the importance of TAM or lack of importance in TAM when entering into the market and how actually having a very smart strategic insertion point. So for Henry, it was you know, cap tables. I mean, David, you're a VC, I'm a VC. Cap tables for VCs is an investment opportunity. Everyone in the boardroom is going market size, market size, market size. But when you look at actually the opportunity that was in front of them, when they immediately open up 401ks and with every layer that they un unlock or unravel within this kind of ecosystem, they add or layer on this incremental layer of kind of value, be it two or three or 400 million with every unlocking. And suddenly you have this monster in an ecosystem that was previously locked by market size, and then the market isn't the issue anymore. And it's it goes back to the 1N versus M1, which I thought was fascinating. And then he also talks about, and I, I really believe this too, and it's like the best com companies fundamentally own their lines of distribution. There's always cases where people will put on Twitter, oh, you're wrong, and of course there have been other companies, but owning your lines of distribution end to end, to me is fundamental. And, you know, you'll hear Henry discuss it in the episode, but that was a big takeaway for me. And it's always been seminal to the show and how we think about, you know, uh, recording and distributing the show in terms of owning every facet from newsletter to site to podcast. We have to own and control every element. Again, something that took me till I was 40 to learn. I, I had a company um, I contact, not the one that people have heard of that did well, but we did sell them the domain name uh, when we failed. And... I wrote a post called Life in the Deadpool, which is all about not controlling your own distribution on the internet, right? It's the it's the thing that matters the most. You, you have to really nail how you're going to get the thing out there. Totally. I, I think another one is also like, I always remember uh, Kent Goldman at Upside, a seed fund, said, Harry, when it comes to price, use price as a litmus test for your conviction. And I, you know, I think about it and I go, huh, what does that really mean? What does that really mean? And it's like, would you pay three for it? Yes. Would you pay five for it? No. Well, that in itself is incredibly telling of the conviction and confidence that you have. You know, if you're not willing to move a little bit, like it, it's, as I said, the variance in price is a litmus test for how much you want to do it. And I, I always think back to that one for sure. Some great episodes. We'll link them in there and uh, hopefully we'll get the PillPack one as well. You know, we teach them to do more faster when they're in tech starters. That's probably why PillPack did it twice as quick. Of course, yeah, yeah. I, well, I did not mean to deliberately wrap the textiles company, but um, congrats on that one, David. It was a great outcome and really fun to, to watch those guys grow. I want to do the rapid fire, which we, as you know, ripped off from you. You may or may not have done a few of these in your life, but on the other end, uh, and I, I, I got a trick one in here too. I'm going to give you a little hint. Let's do it. What's your favorite city in the world that everybody should visit? Oh, that's that's such a tough one. I uh, I haven't been on holiday since 2014, and so my travel has been remarkably limited. Having said that, I'm also Norwegian, um, and I absolutely adore Sheen, which is a small town in Norway, but it is the most quaint, wonderful, charming place I think in the world. It's it's absolutely incredible, and if there's a place that I'm going to retire to, it will be Sheen in Norway. The Sheen Tourism Department thanks you. What's a great book that you've read uh, recently, or one of your favorites that you can share? Oh yeah, totally. Well, I have a really weird love in terms of books. Um, I, I love kind of stories of um, tr like actually tragic female heroines. So I love like um, Anna Karenina, absolutely incredible. My, my favorite of all is Madame Bovary. 
Uh, it's just such a, a special book. And I think actually uh, incredibly reflective of society today and how we view kind of social and financial status as kind of core capital to that person. Um, so Madame Bovary, Anna Karenina, I absolutely loved uh, Bad Blood. Um, I thought it was uh, just a fascinating read. And then now I'm reading actually Annie Duke's Thinking in Bets. I, th- I think she's phenomenal and I'm absolutely loving it. Awesome. On the show, Harry, do you really talk that fast or are you editing? Remember, rapid fire, got to give me a quick answer. Uh, I do not talk that fast. You know what's funny? Everyone, when they meet me, is like, oh, you don't talk as fast as you talk on the show. And I'm like, no, it's edited. What charity, if any, would you urge people to get involved in or check out? I, I'm super passionate about uh, MS, multiple cirrhosis, and work pretty closely with MS UK. My brother's on the board there, actually. And the reason I'm passionate about this one is because there's a lot of research that goes into medical you know, solutions for MS, and that's incredibly valuable and so worthy. But I don't also think that we can forget about the mental trials and tribulations that come with MS. And this is a charity that dedicates itself to MS sufferers and helping support them and their families in the day-to-day struggles that come with it in terms of mindset, in terms of approach to certain tasks, whatever they may be, but dedicates themselves to that, which I, I maybe don't think enough attention gets brought to. Hopefully people listening will support that and uh, Techstars will as a little thank you for you being on the show. We'll make a donation uh, to that charity as well. And obviously a worthy one. Awesome, Harry. Um, thank you so much. Are you not going to ask the next five years? Come on, David. You've listened to enough shows. <laughs> if you want to answer it, shoot. What's next for you? Honestly, I, I consider myself extremely lucky to work with um, my two partners, Fred and Pia. Super excited about building Stride into kind of the leading early stage franchise in Europe. I just, I couldn't be happier to do it with the two people that I'm doing it with uh, in a time where I don't think it's ever been better for Europe. So that's the plan over the next five years. And you can hold me to it with a mojito. (laughs) It feels like five years for you is 20 years for other people that I know. So hopefully you'll even get there quicker than that, but you're well underway. And uh, watch out for those Techstars companies. You might want to fund a few of those with Stride as well. For sure. All right. Thanks for being with us. We really enjoyed the talk. Thanks, David. See you soon. Recently, Brad and I released the second edition of our book, Do More Faster. We're really excited about it. It's totally refreshed from 2010 when we initially wrote it. It's got all new stories and new things that we've learned. We worked with some awesome contributors and got their stories and advice, people like Tim Ferriss, Eric Reese, other successful entrepreneurs. In the book, we really try to give first-time entrepreneurs the tools, insights, and experiences to help them do more faster. You can learn more at domorefasterbook.com and find it today on Amazon. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks a lot for listening to the show today. We'd love to hear your feedback, ideas, or who you'd like to hear next on Give First. And please leave a rating and review, ideally a good one, and reach out anytime to podcasts at techstars.com or on Twitter, I'm at David Cohen. See you next time. Don't forget, Give First.